Tabata Amarau, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. I, I, I really look forward to, to, to talking. We had the pleasure of meeting when we did an event together at the Obama Foundation Summit on Democracy uh, uh, about a month ago. And, um, you know, I thought you had so many interesting things to say and you would be the perfect person to explain Brazil to, to, to our audience. So, um, you know, people were very, very worried about Bolsonaro possibly being re-elected and possibly refusing to accept the outcome of a presidential elections. Tell us a little bit about the state of Brazilian democracy at this crucial hinge moment. Okay, well, um, Brazil is a complex country and for sure we are uh, living, going through one of uh, the most complex moments in our recent history. So I'll do my best in trying to explain what's going on. And just to say that, as I told you when we met, I'm a big admirer of your work. I'm a reader of what you write, so I'm really honored to be here. Well, um, we were able, and I say we because it was a very broad coalition, to uh, beat Bolsonaro uh, in the voting booth, uh, but it was a very tight election. So there were two rounds, and that's how it works in Brazilian uh, federal elections. And in the second round, uh, there were a little, uh, almost 120 million voters, and the difference was only 2 million votes. And this after everything my country went through, all the hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of deaths that could be avoided in COVID, uh, all the deforestation, all the attacks against journalists, uh, after this whole, this after Bolsonaro claimed himself in his words, and this is recorded, that if he was going to win, he would increase uh, the Supreme Court size, the same uh, Chavez did in Venezuela. I say that because it's shocking to me that so many people still voted for Bolsonaro uh, after those four years. And even and, though... and why do you think that is? I want to get to why the opposition managed to beat him later, but but why did Bolsonaro, despite being quite unpopular, despite having a very rocky time in office, why was he able to sustain the support of about 49% of the people who who, who went to, to the election a few months ago? Um, I, I, would, I also want to hear your opinion on that, but I think there are many factors that are working right now. So even though, yes, things um, have been pacific, I think I can say that after the second round, there are still thousands of people in front of military facilities asking for a military intervention. I think about a week and a half ago, uh, some of Bolsonaro's supporters, they put fire on cars here in Brasilia, where I am right now, and they try to uh, invade, to occupy uh, the hotel where Lula was staying. And I say that because maybe that shows us uh, what's going on. There are this big junk of the population that doesn't feel democracy matters or works for them, that doesn't seem to be voting because of economic reasons. Our economy went really, uh, did really uh, bad in the last four years. Um, and it doesn't seem to be only about corruption either. So the big thing, if you ask someone, why do people vote for Bolsonaro and why do they hate the PT, the Labour Party? They'll tell you that it's because of corruption. PT was so corrupt in power that uh, they can they cannot support PT. But if you are a little bit more careful, uh, actually the biggest corruption scandal of the last decades is happening right now under Bolsonaro. It's called the secret budget. Yesterday, um, the Supreme Court uh, ruled the, the secret budget inconstitutional. So it was a, a huge uh, move to, uh, to leave it this way. So I think it's less about corruption, less about the economy, uh, and not so much about what people tell you in the polls, and more about everything that uh, all the changes that Brazil went through that made people feel they didn't belong anymore, that people didn't care about them. So I, I think Bolsonaro was an answer not only to PT, the Labour Party, and the good and the bad things that they did in power, 
but it was more an answer to the whole system. Like uh, you guys from the left to the right, you don't represent us, you are so corrupt that we would either uh, would uh, prefer to implode the system than to support any of you. Because yes, the PT was uh, defeated in, in the previous election, but the center-right parties were too, like PSDB. So I, I have the feeling that it's more about, uh, we don't like any of you. Uh, we don't want democracy and institutions and all those things that uh, don't represent us. And it's becoming to be a very long answer. So I will finish, uh, conclude by saying that uh, Brazil is changing. Um, some decades ago, someone like me, who comes from a, a poor background, who is a, a woman, would not be here uh, in Congress. And and I think uh, those changes are scary to some people um, because Brazil did not do well in terms of the economy. Some people will blame those changes and saying that they are being uh, left behind. But I think the, the most important point is that some people feel uh, there's a lot of arrogance in those in power. And the, the whole uh, being politically correct and you cannot say that anymore you cannot think like that uh, i i'm better than you i'm morally uh, more evolved a and i think that uh, those things really speaks to to the mind and to the heart of those people in terms of identity and who they are and stop supporting bolsonaro in some way will be uh, denying their own identity so, well, uh, lots of things. Interesting. First. Yeah, that's, there's a lot on the table there. That's that's super interesting. Let me pass a few of those things out. So the first is, um, I, I think I agree with you that wherever these uh, populist insurgents win, a big part of the reason is that the uh, existing uh, government or the existing political establishment has lost this trust of people, right? There's always this throw the bums out. We don't trust anybody. You're all the same. And so the more shocking a, a newcomer is, the more different they are from a political class, the more they're denounced by the existing political forces in the media, the more appealing they are nearly by definition. Because if all these people I distrust hate this person, there must be something okay about them. And I think there was clearly a dynamic of that with Donald Trump in 2016. There was clearly a dynamic of that with Bolsonaro when he first was elected for five years ago. Um, I also find plausible your account of those social and cultural changes, but I guess I, I, I have a question about that because um, uh, this fits easily in a narrative, as you might tell it in the United States or in some parts of Europe, where these far-right populist parties are supported mostly by the people who used to be dominant in society, or at least who used to have a relatively good position in society. So, um, you know, let's say people who in the United States might have been uh, members of a sort of, you know, country club who uh, are quite conservative, quite affluent, and suddenly they feel like the town is declining, they're not as affluent as their parents, where there's all of the socioeconomic changes, there's moral changes they don't like, and so on and so forth, right? Um, more broadly, you can say it's a sort of declining white population, which wants to assert its dominance preserve its dominance as they are sort of getting to be the, the minority. That's the sort of story that's often told about this, right? And uh, I guess my question is, does that fit in Brazil? Because as I understand it, there are some people like that who support Bolsonaro. It is interesting that uh, he is one of the very few populists who does better in affluent parts of the country, in the country south, than in less affluent parts of the country, like the country's north. Um, but it also seems to be a lot more complicated than that, right? My understanding is Bolsonaro also does quite well in the favelas, that there's a lot of uh, people who are not white who support uh, Bolsonaro very strongly. So sort of, does that story of rebelling against cultural change fit for those voters? Because they themselves seem to be part of a cultural change, right? Yeah, I, I would say yes and no, <laughs> in the sense that uh, it, for me, it does play a role in Brazil, but maybe to a lesser extent than in the US. And I say that because, yes, there are many people, as I told you, who uh, they just don't don't want to get used to the idea that uh, now we have more Black people, more women, more young people, more people who come from the peripheries occupying their place in politics. 
And I, I say that with uh, a lot of certainty because of all the life threats I have received myself and all the hate, it has a lot to do with what I represent and not so much with uh, how I vote. It's like, you shouldn't be there. Like uh, we, we won't allow it. But uh, as you already mentioned, there are lots of poor people, black people, um, working people who support Bolsonaro. I come from a very large family. My mom has 26 siblings and I have many uncles who support Bolsonaro. And none of my uh, uncles had the opportunity of attending college. Many could not finish high school. So it's not about, um, oh, we don't want uh, the poor to, to do well. And I see that it has more to do with their identity, like their moral identity that they feel are threatened. So I come from a re religious community. Uh, I come from a very conservative family. And I I remember uh, I went to Harvard for college and I remember the first time I went back home and I had uh, understood myself as a progressive woman and I had all those ideas and all those beautiful words in my mouth. And at first I was very um, arrogant with people who were around me. And I remember pointing my finger and saying, you are uh, bad. What you said is unacceptable. And a friend told me that Harvard was bring brainwashing me. And I felt very bad because I, I want to belong in my community. And I had uh, to find my way of being very strong in my positions uh, against sexism, against racism and homophobia and so on. But not acting as if I was better than my family members or my friends. I just was going through a very different path, a very different journey. And I say that because I feel that uh, not only uh, when the, the left was in power, the changes were not so big. But like there were some changes. Uh, the, there are more black women and poor people in university right now and flying and and so on. And I think uh, those people were like, okay, uh, this is too much, but it's more than that. It's about like, suddenly they feel you cannot say some things, you cannot act as if you are, and no one is giving you a good reason. They are just pointing fingers at you and saying you don't belong in this new society anymore. And it's a really hard dialogue. Uh, this campaign was extremely hard to me because I'm still a religious person. I still go to church every Sunday. And I remember in my first election in 2018, religion was not a thing in my election. Like people liked me or not. They liked my ideas or not. And in this election, I saw my church uh, divided in two. And some people were telling me that I should no longer go to church because I voted for Lula or that uh, I was denying all my Catholic uh, teachings and so on. And that's like, that's sick, like that's unacceptable. So I think um, to, to summarize, some uh, ev black poor evangelicals will vote for Bolsonaro because they have this feeling that Bolsonaro represent their family values in a, in a context in which they feel the left, especially is threatening their family values. And I, I promise it will be my last comment, but. Um, my father, he had drug addiction, and it's a very big problem in, in the favelas and in the poor communities. And I myself never felt that the left had anything to offer to my father. So here, if you are a poor person, you cannot uh, be in clinics unless they are uh, religious ones. So those are the clinics that my father could uh, refer to. And... Uh, the left will only speak about legalizing drugs, which is a very important theme when you talk about uh, security policies, but it's not a health policy. Like you turn to me, you turn to my mom and you say, okay, we'll solve everything. We'll legalize drugs. And you're like, okay, uh, uh, I myself can even have that conversation, but the only thing I want to know is how you make sure that uh, young people in the favelas won't have access to drugs, that those who are already sick will have treatment. So in that sense, I think the, the discussion has become so much about Twitter and so elitized that uh, people are like, okay, you just want to destroy our families and you have nothing of concrete to offer us.
So. So, so that's fascinating. So when you talk to your uncles who who voted for Bolsonaro, or when you go back to that community that feels that the left is missing some important part of the social reality there, how do you try to do better? How do you um, try to argue for your values, um, try to persuade people, but without making the mistake you might have made when you were back from your first sort of academic year at Harvard, without... Um, falling into what you call this elitized discourse, where you know you're just lecturing people, and 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 the reaction, uh, understandably, is just going to be you don't understand anything about who we are and what we're talking about, and go go, go back to your Twitter bubble. How how do you manage to 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 walk that tightrope? So I think the first thing is not act as if I was better, and I. I don't remember fighting with anyone in my family or my uh, friend circle because of the election. And that's really rare to find in Brazil. Like I'm still friends with those people because they are not fascists. They are not what Bolsonaro is like. They voted for Bolsonaro. They are not Bolsonaro. And for me, it's more like I, I won't stop talking to them because of that. And I, I will be hurt by some of the things they say, especially some of my uncles. Uh, but for me, it's more like trying to understand where they come from. So, for instance, there is this person who in my family who came from Bahia, as my mom did, who worked really hard to uh, to maintain his small business. And he has this feeling that the whole system is against him, that left and right are united to make sure they pay as much as uh, he can to the government and that so he is that in the middle of that thing that he doesn't receive the basic income uh, funds, but uh, he works really hard to pay for private uh, medical care, to private education to his children. And uh, he just feel like the whole system is there to uh, to steal and uh, to do bad by his family. And I try to argue to him that they are not all the same. So I'm not like, you are wrong. I'm, more like yes i understand it sucks it's a it's horrible but bolsonaro is also stealing and bolsonaro is also corrupt you cannot say that he's different look at that that at that and they are not all the same like you know me you, you know how i'm doing my work like there are some different people there but uh and, and i always try to explain to them that my life is more in danger because of bolsonaro and all the times he and his sons went uh, with fake news about myself. So that's how I deal with my family, I guess. But in public, it has more to do with like showing what Bolsonaro really is. So I was one of the authors of the, uh, how can I say? Of uh, the thing that was judged by the Supreme Court saying that the secret budget was unconstitutional. And one of my uh, daily job is to tell people all the corruption that's going on in this government. More in the same that uh, I don't think uh, the, 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 we have sense in the left and the right. Many horrible things have happened, but it's important to understand that Bolsonaro is not different. He's doing yeah. the same or worse with uh, many more additions in terms of his authoritarianism and his violence. Um, you've alluded a few times to a personal story, but um, you know, I'd, I'd have to hear a little bit more about it. So, you grew up in in, in a poor family, in a in a very large family, and a very religious uh, community. Um, what has been your path from, uh, you know, a community that's far from power, that's far from influence, to being, you know, one of the youngest Congress uh, people in 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 Brazil? How how did you go from from A to B? So uh, my story is a story about education from the beginning to the end. Um, I come from a very typical family uh, in Sao Paulo. Both my parents, uh, their families uh, come from the Northeast, which is the poorest uh, region of Brazil. My mom, she got pregnant when she was in high school. So, uh, and she was not supported by my biological father. She then met my father who was the most amazing person I've met in my life, but who was uh, uh, a very sick person. So my father had uh, bipolarism. Can I say it like that? Uh, he had a uh, drug addiction. And so like uh, 
very normal to my context, very hard in general. And for us, uh, church was always a very uh, important presence. And I think that's what make, make me understand that you cannot just say that oh, the problems with the church, because the church is also the solution in those poor communities. So they were the ones who supported us with food when we needed. Uh, it was in church that I spent all my weekends doing service and learning and so on. And I had a very unique opportunity with a math Olympiad when I was 11 years old. Uh, this national big math Olympiad that was created uh, by the Ministry of Science Technology, Eduardo Campos, during uh, the Lula government. And I got a scholarship because of a medal in the private school and my life changed for good. I had And so you how were you selected to participate in this math Olympiad? You were sort of in a state primary school and some teacher realized that you were talented at math or what was sort of even the path to get to the math Olympiad? So uh, it's a very great policy because uh, all public school students are <laughs> not forced, but they are invited to participate. So it's the biggest Olympiad in the world. Uh, the numbers have reached to 18 million students participating. So I was just like a normal day in school. I had a great math teacher who decided to prepare some students to that competition, but no one really understood what it was about. And I got first a silver medal and then a gold medal when I was in sixth grade and uh, seventh grade. And just one comment about the Bolsonaro government, they have cut all the funds uh, for the Olympiads. And in Brazil, parliament, uh, MPs, Congress members, they uh, tell how a part of the budget will be used. And every year I put uh, a huge chunk of my budget in those Olympiads because they do transform lots of lives. So that's how I end up uh, in a private school for scholarship. It didn't take so much time for my teachers to understand that I was in a special condition that I would need more than the scholarship. So they started to take care of my uh, food and my uh, public transportation tickets and the clothes that I didn't have to attend things. So I had many great uh, teachers who were my friends and my supporters. They were the ones that told me about Harvard and, and MIT who got uh, this scholarship for me to study English when I was in high school, who supported me to participate in all sorts of Olympiads. So I received over 40 medals. I wanted to be an astrophysicist. I traveled the world competing for Brazil. And I had that very strong, like I'm going to be a scientist and that that's my life. And then uh, four days after I got into Harvard with a, a full scholarship, I lost my father to drug addiction. And of course, um, it was really hard. And for a few days, I gave up on the idea of attending Harvard or any college at all. But again, my teachers were there for me and they were very emphatic in saying that if I didn't go, it might take very long until another student coming from where I come from had the same opportunity. I went, I switched my major from astrophysics to government. And I decided at some point that I wanted to work with education to the rest of my life. I have been a teacher. I have uh, organized young uh, people movements. I have been a radio commentator to speak about education. I've done a few things. And at some point, I was very pissed off with politics and politicians. I was very tired of knocking on doors and people receiving me during the elections and not receiving me afterwards, saying they would do something and giving up later uh, or just not caring and like acting as if they didn't care because they didn't attend public school, their children didn't attend public school. And I think this desire to, to run, to affiliate to a party and to run came more as a an answer, like, okay, I'm fed up. <laughs> How you run? And I, I was sure I wouldn't win, but I just could not keep be acting as if I believed things would change uh, if it was not true politics. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how I got there in summary. That, that, that makes sense. And like a good politician, you do end up with your political mission at the end. But I want to I want to get go back one or two steps. Um, uh, you know, when you arrive at this private school, um, what was that like? Because it feels to me like like a lot of people who've made uh, sort of a rapid socioeconomic transition within their own lives 
you're sort of native to two different Brazils, right? You're native to a, a poorer Brazil with very limited opportunity where presence like drug addiction, uh, problems like drug addiction are very, very present. But then also at a relatively young age, I take it at when you were 11 or 12, you became a kind of member of this much more privileged Brazil of, of people who have these opportunities. And you were sort of half a member of it, right? You had the scholarship, you were able to go to that school. But of course, I imagine that in some ways you were an outsider because you were not offered. Your parents didn't do the same things as the parents of a classmate. What was that experience like? Did you feel included? Did you feel like an outsider? Um, uh, you know, was it schizophrenic to have this sense of being these two very, very different milieus and wandering the day and the other when you went home? Yeah. What did that feel like? Um, it's one because I found out about inequality <laughs> about, because I always assumed that most people lived like my family and um, we had family members who did worse, who did better. Uh, but I always had that feeling that it was us and uh, that's how people would live their lives. And even though I was born and raised in Sao Paulo, I didn't know like uh, the monuments and the big avenues. And I had only been to Bahia, my mom's estate, uh, in a bus uh, trip. So I remember when I first went to Ibirapuera, which is the biggest park of Sao Paulo, or when I first uh, stepped in Paulista Avenue, which is a very important avenue in my city. And I was like, okay, this exists and nobody told us. And I had uh, I had that guilty on me because I got the scholarship in the private school and my brother didn't get any scholarship. And my brother went his whole high school without one chemistry lesson. And he had uh, later to get a scholarship to attend a prep school because there was no way he would uh, pass into the university test with what he had in public school. And I always had that uh, guilty that, oh, oh, and asking myself, why am I here and my brother's not? Why am I here and my colleagues um, back from the public school are not? And it was really hard <laughs> um, because I didn't belong uh, to that place. And after uh, a few years, I started to realize that I I was not like, it was clear to me that I was not the, the, tip, the typical kid in the private school. I had to work, uh, I had to do embroidery. I had to take three, four all hours of uh, buses. I didn't know Disneyland, I didn't know the museums. It was a very elite school. So I didn't belong there. And it was really hard to make friends. And uh, all my friends were basically from the Olympiads and like the outcasts, those who didn't fit like me. <laughs> so, and but my teachers helped me and I, I could get through. But after a few years, I started realizing that it was not as easy to belong in my community either because I was talking about different stuff. So a few years uh, later, I started having uh, family members, uh, friends who got pregnant very early, who dropped out of school because they had to work, uh, who just were in very different moments of life. And I sometimes feel I carry this feeling with me up to this day that uh, I'm not the typical uh, young woman from the periphery. I speak four languages. I, I'm white. I had all sorts of privileges. Um, but I don't ever feel I will belong to these elite places that I occupy sometimes. And I had that feeling at Harvard too. I was in the, considered the best university in the world and I'm, I'll be always grateful for that. But I never had money to go to restaurants. I, I had to work through my whole university uh, as a babysitter to send uh, money home. I could not do all the expensive trips. Uh, so it was really hard. Uh, I think the difference is now uh, that things are so divided in Brazil. It's clear to me how much this experience has taught me. I'm very well known in Brazil for um, praying, like for cheering for dialogue, for saying that it's important. And many people think that it has to do with politics, but I had to learn how to be in a family reunion with my friends back home and be very careful not to, not to sound arrogant again, because the experiences I have access to, many of them never heard about. 
because of how unequal this country is. But I also have this constant feeling that I also don't belong here in Congress. I'm so different <laughs> from my colleagues. And I'm not saying I'm better or worse. I'm just very different. The way I do politics, the things I stand for. So I think uh, sometimes it, it hurts. Uh, it, we are human and we, we want to belong everywhere we are. But I also have this feeling that learning to put um, these fancy places and my community inside myself uh, were the best practice I could have to try to be a bridge in this moment that Brazil is so divided. So. Um, so I'm trying to think of where to go next. Um, so now there's a new government coming in. Um, and I have the sense that you feel a little bit ambivalent about it in the sense that you are very, very happy that Bolsonaro is out of office. Uh, you campaigned for, for, for Lula. Um, but you also have some concerns about how Lula will govern and the new government and its ability to overcome that divide you're talking about rather than deepen it and, and make it worse. So what do you think we should expect for Brazil in the coming five years? And what are the choices that the the new president can do right or wrong? Where, where are the points where you really hope he's going to take path A, but you're worried that he might take path B? Okay. So I'm a hopeful, a hopeful person in general. <laughs> I'm working and I'm cheering that my country does well because people are tired. Like there is, uh, there is a, a limit of how much suffering a country can go through, a person can go through. But um, I'm mostly scared, even though I'm really hopeful that some people haven't learned their lesson. Uh, Bolsonaro was elected for a reason. People distrust, distrust parties and politicians for very good reasons. And we haven't had one single government since the democratization that was not corrupt, that didn't have like very, and I'm not saying the presidents were involved themselves, but that had very, very big corruption scandals. And the thing with Bolsonaro and Trump and all those uh, authoritarian leaders that make us all unite to, to defeat them is that uh, the, the threat is so big that we stop to look at uh, smaller things. So we were so focused on defeating Bolsonaro and I think that was the right thing to do that I'm not sure if uh, my elderly in politics uh, took the time to understand why Bolsonaro was elected and what role they played in that election. So yes, we prefer anything than Bolsonaro, but Brazil was not perfect before Bolsonaro. People want a change. They went to the streets in 2013 asking for change. One change uh, is related to corruption and the fight against corruption. We just had an event last week that uh, Congress, because there was the Supreme Court voting going on to end or not the secret budget, which is like 20, 20 billion reais that are in the hands of politicians in Congress. And we have no idea what they do with that money. Like it's from our budget. So while the, the voting was happening in the Supreme Court, Congress tried uh, passed a law, uh, changing some of the mechanisms to make sure that they would uh, make uh, the, the judging like, how can I say, uh, not to have an impact because they changed the, the written of the law. And Lula supports So sort of to, to do an end run around the Supreme Court, so that even if the Supreme Court yeah. ruled that this has been unconstitutional or illegal, they can continue keeping up exactly. the secret budget. And I was very pissed off because I have spent the last four, like two years and a half fighting against that. And Lula supporters and Bolsonaro supporters voted the same. And I was so angry. <laughs> because it's like and, and why is that because this budget is just something that gives whoever is in power yes. uh, a lot of ability to be corrupt to to to, well, to push through projects they want what why is it that 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 in this very polarized political system supporters of both Lula and Bolsonaro voted for this so together the secret budget was very important for Bolsonaro's uh election um like the process because it's 20 billion reais it's a big chunk of the public uh budget that's 
in the hands of those who uh who are in who, like who are the presidents who are the leaders of the bo both chambers and uh there is no transparency in how that money is used so uh, a, a handful of parliamentary members will tell uh which municipalities will receive that money and that's because it's unconstitutional and the mayors for example they don't have to uh, tell back society how they use the money and there are all sorts of accusations and scandals saying that one municipality put in the records that they had taken out 19 thieves per citizen. Like they, no one, no one cares. And there is this other corruption scandal of those robotic kits that were super overpriced uh, that they were trying to buy for schools that didn't have internet access or water in some cases. So uh, there is no transparency. And there are uh, many reasons for me and uh, journalists to believe that 50% of that money is going to the pockets of politicians. But wow. the leaders of the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate, they will support whoever is in power. That's what we call the Centrum. The physiologists are part of our, our Congress. And they use that money in some sense to support Bolsonaro's uh, trial of re-election. But they use that money to support whoever is in power. But again, we, we spent the last years saying that this was the biggest corruption scandal, that we needed to defeat Bolsonaro to end uh, or summit secret, the secret budget. And then when we finally have an opportunity, most of PT's uh, base votes with the secret budget. What's the message that that sends to the population? That they are all the same. You might put Bolsonaro together with them. You should. But they are all the same. And I voted against it. And I was like, we lost by 18 votes or something like that. But uh, the Supreme Court insisted and say that uh, regardless of how the law is written, it is still illegal. It is still unconstitutional. So yeah, this was a big defeat to Congress leaders. This is the first day after it. So I, I, I have to tell you after in a later podcast what happens. But that's what uh, I, I'm scared about. Uh, corruption is not, I think it's not the major reason why people voted for Bolsonaro because he's corrupt too. But it's it was one big reason. We cannot just give that reason again and say that the system is corrupt, that you should implode the system. The second thing I, I'm scared, and I'll try to be shorter on this, is that again, Brazil has changed in the last 20 years. So between uh, Lula's first, first inauguration and the inauguration that's going to happen January 1st, there are 20 uh, years. And we have more women, we have more black people, we have so much more diversity uh, in general. And I'm scared that they will go with the same players they will invite the same people. And we'll see the same uh, old white rich men in power, just that they are older now. And we are still waiting for the announcements of the ministries, but I think uh, among everyone they announced, only one is a woman and only one is a black person. So that's also one thing that I'm scared because I think that the two are connected. If uh, you have only one type of representation in the executive, those people, they don't connect with the real people. They don't connect with my community. Uh, they don't have the perception that corruption matters to people, uh, that uh, some uh, girls would miss schools because they don't have access to uh, sanitary pads, which was one of my biggest fights here in Congress. So I I'm just scared that they will be just out of touch with the population as a, as they were before, and that people just get more and more and more mad. Uh, you've talked a little bit about what it was like to arrive at at, at that private school. You got a scholarship to. What was it like to to arrive at Harvard? Did you uh, feel that you were welcome? Did you feel that the university actually uh, is doing a good job of engaging with what's going on in the world? Uh, did you find that? Uh, you know, fellow progressives at Harvard had a sense of what's going on outside or or were they sort of preoccupied with their own relatively provincial problems? T tell us a little bit about your experience, uh, you know, as an undergrad in, you know, in a new country, uh, in, in a very different social stratum. Um, uh, uh, what was that like? 
So when I first got to Harvard, uh, first I didn't want to be there because I had just lost my father. And I, I had that feeling like, oh, this guilty uh, bigger than ever, like my father passed away and I'm here. <laughs> okay, uh, why is this happened to me? And that was very important for me to decide to work for education because it was the biggest answer and the best answer I could give to that inequality. And I say that because I think I started hard with this big feeling that I didn't belong there, that I somehow, it was a twisted, uh, not funny plot from life. And I think Harvard did a good job in terms of uh, providing me with uh, what I needed to, to survive. And remember, I come from a place where those things were even like, they're not discussed. Uh, it was at Harvard that I learned to tell my story and that I should be proud of it. That uh, uh, everything we went through as a family, uh, there were not reasons for us to be to feel guilty or to feel ashamed, but the contrary. It was at Harvard that I I realized that uh, I shouldn't hide the fact that I was a, I had a scholarship. So at Harvard they had this very cool thing that uh, you could attend five um, events per semester and the university would pay for it. And remember, I come from a place where my teachers had to put their money to make sure that I would be eating, that I would be uh, taking the bus. So all the basic needs were taken care of. Like I had uh, the dining hall, I had one plane ticket per year. So uh, when I was there, I, I, I always, had like this very big sense of group. I was very grateful. I was like, okay, uh, this place is really like I had, I got a hundred dollars to buy a coat. Uh, so that was like my first impression. Like this place is working really hard to make sure that um, I, I belong here. After a few years, <laughs> I'm a little bit more critic uh, of this whole thing. And I think that's because I don't feel as guilty as I felt in the past. And I am I can be a little bit more, um, and also some years have passed. And I can see how hard uh, college was to me. Like it was no fun. Uh -huh. I had to work my entire college. Uh, and I, I wrote a thesis. I was doing all those clubs and I was doing everything. And I had to work so much more than uh, my colleagues because I wanted to pay for the second ticket to see my mom during winter break. We had just lost my father, like I needed to be there. And my mom was unemployed. So uh, I just have this feeling that uh, if I was in charge of it, I would do a little bit more to make sure that uh, students like me, uh, they would be closer to have the same experience as others. Like I spent my four years at college making all these small um, uh, sums. Like if I buy this cookie, I won't be able to buy this thing that I really need. If I buy this book, and that takes a lot of, of your uh, mental uh, efforts, I, I would say. So again, I'm very grateful. Harvard did so much better than any university uh, is prepared to do in Brazil in terms of including students. But, uh, and I always say, say like now uh, there are many more uh, poor kids like me who go to Harvard than there were like, I think I was one of the first ones. And I always tell them like, uh, if you need, you should uh, uh, take a loan uh don't work that hard you'll be able to uh, pay things back after you leave college just because i don't see uh today I, I, i'm more critic about how romanticized some stories are told it, there is nothing nice about me working so much while i was trying to to go through college it is not it's not nice me about me spending so much uh, mental uh effort to make sure I wouldn't be out of money in the middle of the month. And yeah. so I think it's less about what the college would give and more about we really talking about those things. I I had this feeling that people were doing so much to include me, but at the end of the day, all my friends they are uh, internationals or sons and daughters of international people. 
I, I wasn't able to make one single American friend uh, who was like the son or the daughter of Americans. And I don't say that to blame the American people, but I think it it uh, speaks about uh, the dynamics of, uh, at those universities. I remember like my English was really bad when I got into Harvard. Like I, I just barely passed the test. I could understand when an American was saying, uh, like was speaking, it was really hard in the beginning. And I had that feeling that I was always apologizing for my English and people are always like pointy fingers and they're not patient and they wouldn't say that uh, twice. So I think it's more about society than about uh, Harvard and maybe more about American society than the Harvard. It, if it was today with the confidence I have, the first thing I would reply is like, do you speak Portuguese? Do you speak Spanish? <laughs> like uh, when you speak Portuguese as well as I do, you can criticize my English. But back then I, I just felt that someone was doing so much and they were doing so much, but I had that feeling that I didn't deserve it, that I, I was in a position to question anything. So I think like, they did a very good job and I'm very grateful in trying to include me, but uh, clearly there are limits to how much someone who is poor is included. Like I was not friends with those people who are in the fraternities and whatever, <laughs> and the eating club and all those things that Princeton and Harvard have. have. Those are the universities I know uh, more, but uh, I made my best friends for life. Just that they were not Americans and they didn't come from those rich, famous families. So maybe that will be the next step, making sure that we are really take the extra miles to to make sure that people don't feel someone is always doing more than they deserve. Um, uh, you know, you you talk about coming from a very religious community, and my understanding is that that you're Catholic. Uh, my imagination of Brazil is as one of the most Catholic countries in the world. And I imagine that a lot of listeners to this podcast will have this image of Brazil, which was true 30 or 40 years ago. Um, but the religious landscape in Brazil has changed radically, right? We're now, depending on the different statistics you look at, I understand that nearly 40% of evangelicals. Um, and it may be that uh, Brazil will, within a relatively short number of years, have a majority of of evangelicals. Um, tell us a little bit about this phenomenon. You know, what is the cause of this deep social and religious transformation, um, and how does it explain some of the political trends we see? How does that interact with the strength of somebody like 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 Bolsonaro? Mm -hmm. So I am a Catholic, but I think I can speak a little bit about that. Uh, because my church, in many senses, is not very different from an evangelical church. Uh, it's a very uh, rooted, uh, it's a church very rooted in the community, in the poor community. So like there are no rich people attending my church. The majority of the people there are black. Um, we have all the all the dancing and all the singing. Uh, that I, And I even remember like the first, Times I went to a, a, a mass at like uh, churches who were more in the center of Sao Paulo. I was very like, it didn't feel like my court because uh, there are so many blonde people <laughs> and uh, people are not dancing and they're not like singing. <laughs> they're so serious. So I think that uh, I can speak about the experience of attending a, a church in, a, in the periphery. And of course, there are differences between evangelicals and Catholics, and then we'll have to invite an, ev an evangelical to the conversation. But to me, it was all, all we had. Like uh, Brazil has um, many social policies, but not all of them um, reach people. Right now, we have, in theory, uh, a basic income that guarantees uh, that people have uh, up to 600 reais per family. But we have 30 million people who are in hunger at this moment. So many policies for us to change. But I remember that one, when we needed it, uh, it was the church who provided us with meat and food. Uh, even up to this day, there is no uh, single cultural or sports or anything fun uh, facility near my house, public facility. 
And it was a church that we had all those competitions and sports and uh, language lessons and like all those group meetings and choirs and whatever. So it was all we had to do. And because uh, of my father's ad addiction, my mom was so scared that me and my brother would like fulfill the words of our family members and go through that path that she made sure we were in church every single hour uh, we had to spare. So I think churches have like this, this thing that they give you a community. Uh, they give you support when you need. They give your children uh, time to uh, what to do. And of course, there are uh, some ver very um, conservative uh, parts of church, even in the Catholic church. I remember I had this experience, one very particular branch that the reality they were portraying, like it was so homophobic, so sexist that even I was like, okay, okay, uh, this is not what Jesus is teaching me. So there are those horrible things. But church is so much more about positive things to me and like a community. And uh, when uh, left leaders they were so arrogant. I have received so many bad jokes in Twitter because I always have uh, religious things on me and people will be like, okay, you are not smart enough uh, and they'll call me all those names. So there is this idea that if you are rich and enlightened and you have studied so much, you cannot be religious. Like you, you can, it is like bullshit. You should not be listening to it. And I think the only reason why people have such a bad image of churches, like only bad image, is because they have never attended a church like mine. They have never been there to see what it's like. So again, it doesn't scare me the fact that evangelicals will be the majority. And I think it's really, really bad that some left leaders will put it as a threat to democracy. Like it's ridiculous. It just uh, it scares me the fact that churches are the only thing that people have to to go to. When we have sports facilities, when we have uh, government helping people get their jobs, have people get their education, get their basic needs attended, I think uh, we'll have a, a, how can I say, a healthier relationship between those communities and their church because uh, then church can attend to the spiritual needs of people and not to all their needs as it happens today. Because if you live in a place like where I live, many places you can count on crime or church. You cannot count on the state. And I think that's what we should be concerned about and not the fact that uh, evangelicals will surpass Catholics in numbers. What about the basic ideological uh, uh, direction of a new government, both on economics and on foreign policy. Um, the, the the coalition with which Lula has come to power is, as I understand it, very broad. It includes uh, center-left people like you, uh, and it includes also people who are far further to the left. So it includes people who, uh, like you, are very critical of uh, how uh, Hugo Chavez and his successors have transformed Venezuela. Um, and it also includes people whose sympathy seem to lie in some ways with a government in Venezuela, with a government in, in Cuba. Um, you know, what can we expect on economic policy and what can we expect on uh, foreign policy, on the attitude towards uh, those far left governments in Latin America that we have done a lot of damage over the next five years? OK, so I think first, just one comment. Uh, I'm here highlighting all the things I'm scared uh, of because I think there are enough people to upload and that uh, someone has to say, hey, don't look, don't go through this path. It didn't work last time. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, Lula himself, President Lula, is a broad person in the sense that in previous governments, he even invited people who didn't support him to be ministers. And he always tried to have like broad uh, uh, governments. And he's also someone who knows hunger, who attended a technical school. And I carry this belief that this matters, like the experience you went through yourself. That being said, uh, PT, uh, the Labour Party, was elected in a much broader coalition this time than in 2002 or 2006, in the first uh, Lula's government. And I think the direction of the economy and the foreign policy 
and everything that really matters in a federal government will depend on how much this broad coalition is present in government. Because yes, uh, there were people, even the extreme left, who defend communism and revolutions and so on. It's definitely not my case. There are people in the center left, but there is like important political leaders from the center right who supported Lula in the second round. And up to this point, we are not sure whether these people have a voice in the future government or not. But I have this belief with me that uh, a politician should know how they got elected, should know their basis. And it's really important to me. I was not elected with social media. Uh, and I have lost 100,000 uh, followers after uh, one single vote. But I had this belief that they didn't represent my uh, voters. And I think I, I was quite right because I was able to increase my election this time. And I just say that because I'm praying that uh, the future government remembers how they were elected. They were elected in the broadest coalition Brazil has seen in the last decades, at least. And this broad coalition should be in government, should be um, should be in power, should be saying something because Lula represents those people too. The government represents those people too. That's not exactly what we have seen up to this now with the minister's announcement. Uh, there are great ministers, but... Uh, they are closer to the Labour Party uh, than than those who haven't been announced yet. Uh, and I think if uh, Lula is as broad as he has been in his life and as a genius as he has been throughout his political life, he will uh, fight for some space uh, with his party to make sure that those people are in government too. And then we should expect to have... Uh, Economy, economic and foreign policies closer to what we had in Lula. Uh, Lula basically continued to uh, FHC economic policies. Um, things changed a lot with Juma, but under Lula, uh, they were more like a centered vision of the economy, a moderate vision, I would say. And in terms of foreign policies, uh, yes, I'm really mad when uh, left leaders will like just not acknowledge how terrible is what's happening in Ukraine or uh, the the uh, the very bad humanitarian crisis we have in Venezuela. But uh, PT was very democratic in power every single time it was in power. So that's what I hope. That's what I voted for. That's what I, I uh, tried to get votes for in the streets for so many months. But uh, this chapter, we are yet to see. So let's focus on the positive for a moment. Um, uh, where's your hope? What uh, do you want the government to do? Where does opportunity lie in Brazil? If you could set the governing agenda for the next five years, what kind of economic policies, what kind of social changes do you think could you know, help improve the lives of people in poorer communities in Brazil, reduce socioeconomic inequality, but also reduce the extent of social polarization so that uh, Brazil uh, doesn't just escape the threat of these extremist forces for five years, but actually gets onto a sounder political footing for the next 20 or 30 years. So my hopes come from this diversity I've been speaking so much about. So there is uh, USP, the University of Sao Paulo, it's the best university uh, in Brazil. And when I was a child, I would like I was like, okay, I'll never go to that university. Like, it's only for the elite. And um, I think two or three years ago, it was the first time that half of the students at USP uh, came from public schools. That's huge. Like, USP is the university. It's like our Harvard, like uh, that uh, is forming the future politicians and uh, the future scientists. And half of its students come from poor backgrounds. Uh, come from poor families, they are diverse. And I do think you can just put that back in the box. Uh, I do think that's a change for itself. Politicians are working really hard to make sure that this diversity doesn't uh, work, uh, doesn't happen in politics as well. But that's my, my source of hope, like knowing that we'll have so many amazing women, black people, like all LGBT people, occupying all sorts of uh, power places. So that's my biggest hope. And in terms of the future, uh, this is also related to what I just said, but we have to bet on education. 
we didn't like Bolsonaro was the worst president for education ever. Brazil went back to 20 years in dropout rates. Uh, children, uh, half of our children don't know how to read and write at this moment. But maybe this is the opportunity uh, we have to make basic education a priority to see all this diverse talent we have out there and understand that this is the best social and economic policy you can have. And I always say that um, I, I had all my projects vetoed by Bolsonaro and questioned in, in the court, but uh, I was able to like with a broad coalition to win and I have over uh, 10 land projects that were approved. And I always joke that, okay, and there are 120 that I wasn't able to approve. So th there's so much like evidence um, and Brazil has uh, worked uh, walked a very really good path in terms of making the whole uh, society accept basic income. And it, it was very questioned in the past. So there are so many studies showing that if you uh, will give uh, high school students some amount of money after each year they, they finish, uh, you decrease dropout rates by one third, you increase the grades. So that's one, one example. There's so much we can do. There's so much evidence. There are so many discussions that were frozen under Bolsonaro that I have this big hope that uh, we'll, we'll have dialogue again and that we'll be able as a society to make this bet in basic education. Well, I, I hope you succeed, Tabata, and I hope that Brazil succeeds. Me too. <laughs> and regardless of what happens, I'll be here fighting. And that's one thing I'm certain of. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for the invitation. It was an honor.